I remember clearly in middle school we were learning about the segregation and civil rights movement and I had asked my teacher in sixth grade like where were the Mexicans during this time what were they doing because that's that's my culture and she said oh they weren't really a big part of history he still felt like outside of his group even with his group of friends I found that I wish that I were 10 years older and my grandma was 10 years younger. Um, I feel like as though if that were the case, my grandma would have remembered a lot more. My father, who was an undocumented immigrant, actually was in a um, prison facility and was later deported. My initial reaction to the class was I was really excited as a journalism major with a passion for storytelling and documentary production um, when our professor laid out the syllabus and said that our final project for the semester would be a three-part project with a documentary film, a website component, and then a physical gallery. I was just like, oh my god, this is great. So my first day of class, I remember going through this behind the syllabus and then when I was going through it, I was like, Oh my god, so much reading! And I was seriously thinking about dropping the class. But then after hearing about the project and being able to look into my own family history, which I really had no knowledge of my dad, father's side of the history of the family, where we came from and how they got here, and um, um, I was like, all right, I'll give this a shot. Initially, I was a little nervous after looking at the syllabus and seeing that um, we had to read six books. That was a little intimidating a part um, of the class where our final project was to um, get your family's oral history. Immediately off in my head rang some bells that my family has a ginormous book of our family history. I did understand that it was um, going to take all that time, a whole semester to find out my family history and I didn't know anything about my mother's side of the family which kind of caught me off guard. After collecting our oral history, we divided the class into four time periods. We started with time immemorial, we have two Native American students, and these are their stories. First question, what, what is your name? Cecilia Jim. Okay, and what are your clans and where are you from? I am from Carson, New Mexico. Our clan is And where are your parents from? My father was originally from Gallup, New Mexico, a place called Sundance Coal Mine. My mom was from Burnham. A place called Chelchi Shijai. How has immigration changed in your eyes? For example, Europeans, Mexicans, and Asians coming into North America. What was it like um, when you were young compared to now? When I was growing up, there was no such thing as white people, Mexican people. We were all, we were on the reservation and all we saw was um, Navajo people. Mm -hmm. well, seldom do we see white people at school. But that was very seldom. All our teachers were Navajo. So a lot of that stuff we weren't, um, or we didn't know about them until we moved to Kirtland. That's when we started seeing the integration. All the boarding school was the same. They were all Navajo kids. Maybe some Apache kids, maybe some Ute kids, but never white people or Mexican people or people like that. Mm -hmm. 
when I got when I started working, that's when I realized, oh, there's Mexicans. And my boss was white. And then when we got to Curlin, we really got to see that other side of what we didn't see when we were on the reservation. So I was 17 before I found out what a Mexican was. Oh, wow. So living on the reservation, you kind of get sheltered. But it's kind of nice because when you get off the reservation, you get to see what's out there. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit of... Not a shock, but just a change Mm -hmm. that we had, or transition we had to get used to once we got off the reservation when we moved to Oho. During the interview near the end, we got to some of the more heavy-hitting topics, so like why, for example, during her childhood a lot of uh, Native American traditions didn't exist or were really on the down low, as opposed to why they're so um, a lot more popular now today and why they're in my age. And she was so passionate about it, about how she's happy that they're more um, popular now, of course, as anybody would be but in kind of like a righteous way, like, of course we should be this way because you can't stop us anymore, because we can't, um, you can't control us anymore, you can't, you know, tell us how to live anymore, you can't take away our language anymore, you can't take away our families. And I think that was something interesting to see. Gosh, you know, when we were young, I don't remember us ever having a powwow every year, going to a powwow like that. The only powwow I can remember is when we were in Flambeau. We went to the um, Indian Bowl there. There were these seats all in in a a circle there, that Indian Bowl they used to have. And it was more like you went and sat in there, and they, like, put on a show for you there. If we did go to a powwow, it wasn't big, like, spectacular like it is now it's just groups the people getting together a couple of drums and and people just dancing you know and it wasn't as big as it was now people coming from all over and coming there so it wasn't like a powwow it trail like... it wasn't a powwow trail like now nowadays it was just the people in the communities getting together with food and dancing you know and singing sure and that, that's what I remember. What you guys grew up with is not the same. Even when I, what I remember when I was little, they were indoors. Yeah, it wasn't the big spectacular thing that it yeah, is Yeah, with now. the vendors and the camping outside and all the people hanging out all night having campfires, you know. And well, I think it's come back because we could now. You know, it's not taboo to be Native American anymore. It's so much. You know, it's... It, it maybe went away like that, then slowly came back. Yeah. That you could do and celebrate, have your celebrations the way your elders remember, I suppose. That's what I think. I think oh, it's yeah. probably it's like that. wasn't as big as it is now, back then. You know, like that gathering of the nations and whatever. It wasn't prob- as big as it is, you know, it's now and then every year, I suppose, coming forward, it got bigger and bigger. Um, that way back, probably, um, it wasn't like, um, maybe the white people didn't like it that the Indian people got together like that, like, almost like that sun dance. They outlawed that and wouldn't let the Indian people do those anymore. Like it was against the law or something. And that was, I think that's the Sioux people that did that, but, um, it's, it's almost like the white people didn't, didn't let you, the Indian people, get together like that in big groups and do their ceremonies. Like, they, they didn't let, it, let them do it. But nowadays, they can't stop them, you know? It's their, it's their tradition. It's their ceremony. It's, their, it's theirs. So now, now it's just getting bigger, and that's, I think that's just the way it is now. The next time period is the 1600s to 1700s. During this time, a variety of borders and legal statuses impacted the lives of most people. There were borders, but there were not strict laws.
so for for our history of immigration, we're studying our family history. So what what do you know about our family history? The way I understand it, the Carols came from Ireland in the I can't imagine the year, but Grandpa Carroll was part of one of the Alaskan gold rushes. He left the, his five kids and his wife, went to Alaska. He didn't strike gold. <laughs> didn't find any gold? No. Bummer. <laughs> you could have been rich, huh, Papa? Yeah. <laughs> Came back and worked in the oil fields. <laughs> now, where in the oil fields? Is... Orchid used to be an oil-rich area. Where's Orchid at? Uh, just north of Santa Maria, California. Okay. And... Uh, most of the carols worked in the oil fields, except for my dad, who found a job at the bank. Maybe he was lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, right? so, so pretty much we've been living here in the United States for forever. Yeah. Family history is that Charles Carroll of Carrollton, the Declaration of Independence, sang her from Baltimore, had five brothers or four brothers or... He had no children. One of his brothers is a is the original founder of the Carroll family. So, so we've been here in a hot minute and fought in the revolution. Oh, uh, they would have had to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not sure which side. <laughs> Whoever was winning. Though. Right. <laughs> what about the Civil War? Did I've, I've heard stories that that we have had grandparents that fought in the Civil War too. Is that true or? Yeah. Or is that one of our family? Knowing the Carroll family, there's only two that have actually gone to war. And you are one of them, and your father's the other one. So those are the only known ones? <laughs> it's not because we're not brave, cautious. <laughs> So in the 1800s to 1900s, the regulation of immigration moved from the jurisdiction of the state to the Treasury Department to the Justice Department. Several laws restricted to entry uh, barred various groups from naturalization, imposed quotas, and placed numerical caps on people coming from different countries in the Western Hemisphere for the first time. This was the largest group out of our class, and 4453 people found their immigration story during this time period. So my favorite book that I read this semester was Inside of America by Anna Pegler Gordon. I found it incredibly interesting that Chinese immigrants would actually change their entire persona in order to make it easier for them to get into the United States. It talked mostly about Chinese immigration, which was the same time that my family came in, but we are not Chinese. So um, it was funny because my grandma told me a story that when my great grandpa came through um, Ellis Island, he got through straight through, nobody asked any questions, and he walked on by a bunch of people being like strictly interrogated. Mm -hmm. So that really resonated with me. So as you know, kind of what we're doing here with this project is just looking into the history of our family, basically. I'm, I'm interested in hearing the lineage of uh, basically you and your parents and potentially your grandparents for as far back as you can possibly remember and just kind of all the stories that you could tell me about um, what you've heard or what you know about how our family came to the United States. Yeah, I know particularly about uh, my mother's side. I didn't have much contact with my father's side of the family, but uh, my mother's side uh, immigrated uh, about the time of that stage play and movie Fiddler on the Roof, you know, about about 1900. Okay. And they were uh, Russian Jews, either in Russia or uh, all that satellite country they call it now. There, uh, probably it's called Russia. And uh, so they they went to England first. I think they had some relatives there that could get them to England. Uh, my mom's parents and, okay. uh, and then they came to the United States about 1905 or 1900 somewhere in that time period went through Ellis Island and uh, and uh, somehow they ended up in uh, Massachusetts where my mother was born my father's family uh, about that same time period uh, immigrated from Poland uh, probably from the Warsaw area, and they came to uh, either Manhattan, I think they came to Manhattan first, but ended up living in Brooklyn, New York, one of the boroughs. 
On your father's side, from Poland, um, do you know how they came to be over here? Like, you said on your mother's side that they had a contact in England, some family members in England that helped them kind of get over. Was there anything along those lines on your father's side, or...? I'm not sure, but I think so, because my father was the second oldest the son, but he had an older brother that was, who was actually uh, born in England. Oh, okay. So they came to England also. Interesting. I think at that time period, it was easier to get to the United States uh, by way of England. So going back to your mother's side, I guess I I wanna I wanna ask you about the experience of Russian Jews coming to the U.S. And I understand that that's that's a little bit far removed, considering it would be your grandparents that came over, but. Um, do you, have you heard any stories or thoughts along what it was like to go through Ellis Island or anything, any hardships that they kind of experienced on their way over? Just generally, they spoke of it not being a very pleasant trip on the, on the ship. You know, they had to go third class or whatever it was, steerage, I think they called it. Right, right. And they didn't have much, it was a long trip by sea and they uh, couldn't move around as much as they would have liked to. Right on. Uh, much as I know about it. So I did Migra by Kelly Hernandez, and I uh, related a lot to this book mostly because it was the first book that I had read that fully talked about Mexican American immigration and border control. And I remember clearly in middle school we were learning about the segregation and civil rights movement, and I had asked my teacher in sixth grade, like, what were the Mexicans during this time? What were they doing? Because that's my culture and she said oh they weren't really a big part of history and it it kind of tore my heart a little bit because I didn't know where I came from and what I I mean I Mexico was my origins but I didn't know exactly what my place was in the American history books so this was the first book that I really resonated with because it told me more about how the laws were translated and ap applied in American culture Ok, vamos a empezar contigo diciendo tu nombre completo. Miguel Ángel Rubio García. ¿A ¿Cuál es tu edad? 45. ¿Hace cuántos años inmigraste a los Estados Unidos? 22 años. ¿Por ¿Cuál es la razón que emigraste a los Estados Unidos? Pues la primera razón que tuve para venir aquí fue juntar un poco de dinero para regresarme a México y poderme casar. Y después de esa primera vez, uh, imagino que hay otras veces, ¿por qué regresaste? Me gustó la vida aquí como era y me decidí quedarme. Me traje a, la, a mi esposa y e hicimos la vida aquí en Estados Unidos. Um, going into this class, I knew I wanted to learn more about my family history and my family tree and because my parents really didn't know anything about it. Um, once I started going into like ancestry.com, I was able to dig up a lot of information. Even my dad was very interested about it, like he wanted to keep going further than I did. I just like, I just need a few people, but my dad just kept pushing on. And it was very interesting actually finding about how um, my uh, great great grandparents' uh, fingerprints and where they worked and how. We technically still have a long line of agriculture workers until my dad decided to immigrate to the United States. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find anything about my mom as much because she uh, tended to live in a, just in a small um, pueblo, a little town, where there wasn't really any record keeping. I was only able to find up to her mom, which isn't a lot, but it was still interesting to see that there's still a little bit of history for them. Luckily though, my grandma from my mom's side, my mom from my, my mom's mom from my mom's side kept a diary and dated everything from what her kids did and what her husband did and what she did. That way, there's still a little bit of her left after she passed away. Uh, both my grandparents have long passed away, but I really wish that I had the chance to talk with them about um, our family origins in Mexico. That would have been a lot more helpful and a lot more clear as we were going through this process. A lot of my friends had um, grandparents that were alive or people that remembered or did come straight from their origin country, but I wish that I had mine to kind of give me a little more advice to where to go and where to start. But um, the best place I could start with was my aunt because she 
she remembered everything because it seemed like a normal day to her and it's kind of weird how everybody finds the the day that they immigrate because my eldest aunt didn't think that it was anything out of the ordinary or anything special and then my mom is the youngest so she didn't remember anything so it was really interesting to find out that um, the middle child was the one that remembered everything. So through this class with my personal immigration story I um, discovered that my grandfather's um, father actually was an American citizen even though he was born in Cuba and that is because um, I learned my great grand my great great grandfather was born in Puerto Rico and um, in the during the Great Depression it also hit Cuba because they basically had an American economy at the time and they told all people that had dual citizenship that they could no longer um, possess dual citizenship with specifically the United States. And so my great-great-grandfather had to renounce his American citizenship. However, my great-grandfather was still an American citizen under this because he was born um, when my grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, was still uh, an American citizen. Although he renounced it later, because he was born during that time when he still was a citizen, he was in fact a citizen. So, after the Bay of Pigs happened and my family had no way of getting out of Cuba, um, they, my great-grandfather did research and he thought through um, just solely that he was entitled to citizenship because of his father. And so he, they went to the embassy in Havana uh, the Swedish embassy who had a help desk for America and they wrote to the American um, immigration and sure enough he was a citizen and they literally handed him an American passport and gave him American citizenship and all he had to do was simply invoke that citizenship and he became a dual citizen and that's how they actually flew to Mexico on a 28-day tourist visa under that American passport and then um, obviously never returned from the tourist visa and then went from um, Mexico City to Los Angeles under that American passport. So, my dad was born in El Paso, Texas and he was born to Felix Borunda Sr. and Olivia Aras. And they were from a small, small town in Chihuahua, Mexico. And like Chihuahua, Mexico is like a big, big capital city. So it was very, very strange that they would be, well, I guess it's not that strange, but it's, it's, they were in like the same town and like the same you know, little community. I guess they would liken t uh, Chihuahua to be as big as like, probably like it's a little bit bigger than Arizona, but not as big as California. They were there and then they traveled down because my grandpa went to work very, very early. I think they only went to school to like fourth grade in his small little like village. But there's one thing that his father did teach him and we're still talking about my grandpa is they taught them English. They thought English was everything that you needed to become successful. The city that was close to their their little village was like an up-and-coming city so there was always like people that knew English and he would go work there in the tile industry and he you know had to learn you know very very young probably like eighth grade you know how to work but the not only like learning how to work was hard enough being in eighth grade that you really had to just learn to communicate with people because a lot of them were um you know, Spanish speakers. So when they would tell them orders and what to do in English, you know, it was just another like obstacle in his way, but he was over be able to overcome it. So she went to go get some meals to prepare, you know, for dinner. And um, they were walking and she got hit by a car when she was seven months pregnant. And 
with my dad and they were like she's going to deliver her baby like any moment now like the trauma was just too bad um for her to deal with so they're like oh my goodness the nearest hospital is like 10 miles away with no car um no vehicle so they said that the closest hospital was three minutes away and that was in America so what they did was is they put her um in like this cab it wasn't necessarily like a cab but they put her in like this like this wagon or something and they were like we have to get her to the hospital and they went like right across the desert like to the nearest hospital and she went in there and that's she delivered my dad at like seven and a half months he was premature but at that point you know he was an American citizen you know, he was the first one born in America, and um, we don't know why they went there or what happened, but, you know, she was treated, you know, well, and they saved her baby, and, you know, I, I think at that time she was just like, I want, I want to live in America. So she left the hospital, and they went home, and shortly after that, they moved to El Paso, Texas. They, you know, just literally, like, packed up um, because she had it. Well, they had to be there at the hospital because my dad wasn't able to leave. And my grandma was like, I will not leave my baby here overnight. I will stay with him. And, you know, even though I have three other children at home, you know, her husband was going to have to take the role of taking care of them. And... You know, she refused to leave the hospital. So what my grandpa did was, yeah, he really, like, just packed up everyone, moved to El Paso, and it was literally, like, I'm telling you, minutes away. They found a little an apartment, and my grandma refused to, you know, leave the hospital with her baby there. So everybody just started commuting every day to the hospital. You know, it was like a daily thing. And my grandpa would just cross the border, you know, to go back to work. Was it hard for them to cross the border with all the kids at that time? I think he would leave the ch the three older kids at the hospital, and then he would go to work. So I'm not 100% sure if he had to take them to work, but I'm sure there was many, many times where, you know, she was tired or, you know, something happened, but, you know... Um, they would literally go back and forth to Mexico, to America, you know, probably like three or four times a day. Were they questioned at the border, do you know? I'm not sure if they were questioned or not, but I don't I don't know what kind of like, if it was like the same type of border that it is now where there's checkpoints and there's dogs and, you know, this and that. At that time in like 1960, I don't, I think it was just... You know, not even a border. I think it was just crossing the desert, you know. And, um, you know, it's nothing like it was today. Well, the way they described it, you know, it was just like a dirt field. Uh, what is your name? Carlos Palomo Torres. I was born in Guatemala City, Guatemala, at Roosevelt Hospital. Let's first talk about Guatemala. What was the earliest memory that you could, what, as far as back as you can remember, was it one memory you can remember from Guatemala? I do have a memory of when I was, I gotta say I was probably like three or four years old, so I was still pretty young. But in Guatemala they have a tradition um, where they have a bunch of bonfires going. Uh, they're burning the devil in effigy. So it's kind of like a carnival atmosphere where every little house has like a, a, a little bonfire going and what, they're, what it's signifying is that they're burning the evil spirits or the devil in effigy. Oh, Guatemala was a totally different pace of life, very hard. Uh, there was hardship everywhere you look. The economical strife there is, it, it, unless you actually lived in an experience, it's, it's kind of crazy, it's kind of hard to explain. It's so hard. Uh, there's no work. The work that there is is very tough, tough work. Uh, there's a lot of violence in the streets. You see a lot of violence everywhere. There's a lot of crime. There's, you know, a very grim future for all, all the youth. There's not really any outlook. 
Yeah. Um, did you see any like like were you, did you experience any of that violence firsthand or? Well, I didn't experience necessarily the civil violence firsthand, but we did see it all the time in the sense that I. I seen it all around me. Uh, we would see people get picked up by death squadrons and the guerrilla warriors come into town and stuff like that. So we would see it all the time, even though I didn't firsthand necessarily, you know, become a victim or, or uh, anything like that of it. Um, like, it's just a question, a hypothesis, but um, did like any, like did my dad or did my, any of my uncles, like, did they have to run from any of this at all, or did they have to? They, was it challenging for them at all? If you can, do you remember them talking about it at all? I don't know them firsthand. I do know that we did have a cousin in Guatemala who was taken by the guerrilla fighters, and later on was found dead. And he was, if I believe correctly, they they had put him in a garbage bag and they had cut him up in a bunch of pieces. So within our family, we there was people that were starting to get took. Okay. And since then, some of the family that did stay there, we also have had family members that have been victims of the actual police force there, where they become arrested and then later on they're found dead in the trunk of a car. Mm. And we have had family members that that's happened to. So, when when migrating from Guatemala to the United States, how was that? What, what was that kind of experience, if you can remember? Hey, if you know what, I was so young that I was about well, five years old when I went through it, but I still have somewhat of a memory. I don't know if it's been changed as time has gone by, but from what I remember, it was a long, real long journey. And I remember being so scared that at every every spot that, that we would go through, that we were real afraid of, of getting caught and getting sent back to Guatemala and, and back into what we were basically running away from, you know what I mean? Uh, at first going through the borders, and in, into Mexico was, you know, when we first crossed into Mexico, we crossed uh, through the river that uh, borders Guatemala and Chiapas. And we crossed that part of it on boat. From there, we then took a bus all the way to uh, the federal district in Mexico City. From Mexico City, we took a train and while we were on the train, they were boarded by the Mexican immigration and Mexican immigration did their sweep. And most of us happened to go through with no problem, but my Tia Ana at that time was apprehended by the Mexican police. And then she was being held in a Mexican jail. Uh, we then took the train all the way to Magdalena, Mexico. And in Magdalena, Mexico, we landed with basically nothing, nothing but like the clothes on your back and maybe like whatever you had with you, you know what I mean? We literally had nothing. And there was a, a priest who had a church there in Magdalena, Me Mexico, and, and that priest took us in. And basically we were able to stay there at the church while everything else got settled. And uh, Anna was never, we were never, we were never able to get her out of the Mexican jail and she was deported from there back to Guatemala at that time. Uh, we then continued that journey and crossed the border uh, through Nogales, Mexico, into Nogales, Arizona. Uh, we reached the town square in Nogales, Arizona, and that's where we were appreh apprehended by immigration here. Okay. Um, from what you can remember, when crossing into Nogales, Arizona, how difficult was it, or when crossing the border, at that time, what, uh, what year would you say this was, and like how? 1986 huh? was the year that we crossed. I believe it was either April or March of 1986. Uh, I remember we, we had to walk through the night, through the deserty part of outside of uh, of Nogales, Mexico, uh, and I remember having to walk through a large part of the night to get to the border right as it was still not quite daybreak yet. So it was still dark outside. And we ended up going through the fence. Uh, most of the, I mean, it was uh, Wilson, Ellen, Yesenia, my mother Glenda, and my great grandmother, and the coyotes who were crossing us. Uh, I remember that they went over the fence, except for me, 
I went through a hole in the fence and so did my great grandmother. She was too old to jump in and I was too young to jump in at the time. So everybody else hopped the fence and we went through. Then it was a lot of tons of walking until we actually hit the town square in, Nog in Nogales, United States. And there we were there right at the crack of dawn. So the sun was barely starting to come out and when immigration approached us and you know, see. Okay, so um, can you remember the processing procedure when going through immigration when you were being held? I can't actually remember the process part. I do remember being held in, uh, you know, basically jail, as you know, and we were held at least together. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we were we weren't separated at that time, so they at least held us together in there. I remember the immigration guards. My great grandmother was a smoker. Uh, cigarette smoker at the time and I remember that they would come and get her out of the cell every Every evening and, and she'd be able to go uh, smoke with them when they would go on their smoke breaks It was you know, a weird part. I remember going to have uh, You know what you would call dinner or lunch there at the things and it was a big cafeteria where you were being held with other inmates um, Oh, that's cool. Um, how was the treatment like how were the officers towards the yourself and other uh, other uh, other immigration inmates that were there as well. I can't say that, that the officer treatment was bad at all. The officer treatment was okay from from my experience of it. Um, for the most part, they treated us well. Okay. Um, how long were you held before you were able to get out, or were you deported, or? No, uh, we were actually uh, held there. I'm not exactly sure on, on the time because I was only five years old, but I'm going to say about a month, month and a half that we were actually held at the detention center, and then we were granted political asylum. Um, I know one thing I wish I would have done differently would have been to interview, had the chance to interview my actual great-grandmother. Um, she knew a lot about our family history and where we came from exactly. Uh, uh, but luckily enough, she was able to share those stories with my cousin, so that's who I was able to interview. But as I said, like, I wish I would have been able to have the chance to go to the original source because unfortunately she did pass away. Um, what made you come to the United States or like, what was the initial reason that you came? I came to the United States to help out my family, um, to live better. Mm -hmm. Were you not living better? Um, we live a different life that over here, okay? Over there, it's like um, no job opportunities if you don't go to school. I live like a, like in a farm. If you own a piece of land, then you can work on it. Maybe your parents can do co uh, plant tomatoes or corn and they'll sell it at the end of the season or we raise our own chickens. So my dad was the one who came here first. We were seven kids, so he can afford to feed us. So he came over here. Um, then when my my brother came here, when he was like, when he grew up, like 18 maybe, when he finished high school, he brought him over here to work and help out, you know, feed everyone. And then my older sister, so everybody, when they were graduating high school, we were seven of us, so they they'll come to help out, to work over here and. Um, so when was the day that you came over here? Do you remember it? Like how how was that process like? Um, it was like August nineteen ninety three. It was a nightmare. Why? Cause I don't want to come, so I was forced to come. By your parents. Yeah, I have to ride the bus like for about 28 hours with my dad. What bus? The bus, I mean, Mexican bus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with my, with my father that I see him maybe once a year that I was afraid of him because he was like, he'll go every, every year or every two years maybe like once a year maybe for a week or two weeks so we really don't get to know him when i have to come i have to come and sitting i know he was my dad but you know we were like afraid of him so it was hard to come yeah okay <laughs> it's okay <laughs> okay so well we 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 ride the bus like for 
26 hours and we went to a house with people that I didn't know, but they were like my, my father cousin, something like that. So we stayed there like for three hours. So she gave me food and then she told me to take a shower. And I remember I was crying and crying. I was so sad. They said, okay, eat and take a shower because they're all coming for you. And then meanwhile, I was with on the house with this lady that I didn't know. My dad and his cousin went, I think, to find the coyote. So they told me, okay, um, be ready because they're gonna come and get you. And I was like, who's gonna come and get me? I don't remember very well. I'm kind of like blocked those, these things from my mind, but um, I remember they, they dropped me off. They went to pick me up, so they dropped me off in a very ugly neighborhood and and that was I think Tijuana no what's Mexicali and then they picked me up there like a guy so and my dad told me you have to go with this guy and I'll see you later he's gonna cross you out and I was like okay so I went with this guy and and um, he was a young boy, like my age. And then at first I was kind of like, they, it was two guys. So the, the, the little guy, he told me, oh, we're gonna take you to Tijuana. We're gonna cross you out from there. But I was like very afraid. I say like, why my dad leave me with these people? And you know, I feel alone, I feel, scare I feel like very scared well they take me and then the little boy was very nice to me maybe because he saw me crying all the time and he says like don't cry everything it's gonna be okay and then he says I'm gonna take you to the, the street I think it's revolution that's the name they call it you know where they Everybody goes, like the touristic street in Tijuana. I'm gonna take you there, he says, so you can see and, and know Tijuana. And I was like, what else can I say? I mean, I was in his car and I don't even know where I was. So, and then he says, okay, we're gonna stop by this house. You will say that a cop stopped me and everything. So that's why we late. The guy told him something and they, they said, okay, you got the girl, and, and and he says, yes, she's in my car, okay, bring her over. So they told me to put on these clothes. So I, I put on like a t-shirt, and they give me a hat and glass, and then they put me in this room with so many people, so many people, and they were just sitting over there, and then I was like, a lady told me, oh, I've been here like for a couple months. And I was like, oh my God, they were illegals, people waiting to to cross. And they were like hungry and they just, and then the guy told me, you hungry? Like, like I think he was the boss or something. And I was like, no, I was not hungry. So he told a lady over there, give her a sandwich, even though she don't want to eat, give her a sandwich. And then he came and, and he says, come here. So I went there and then he checked me out, you know, like he checked me out. And then he called another guy and then he says, okay, you're gonna put her first on the car because she's white, you know? My skin was blonde. The guy came and he says, okay, I'm gonna cross her out. And I was so afraid. And then I was like, okay, so what else can I do? I mean, I, I was tend to run away, you know, and, and make my dad, you know, and I was like thinking, I'm gonna run away and then I'm gonna call my friends and then I'm gonna tell them that, I, um, that I'm okay and then maybe here, I'm gonna work over here and I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna find an apartment and I'm gonna live by myself. How can my parents do this to me? So the guy told me, okay, let's go. So they they um, they take a picture of me, and then he told me, okay, you're gonna 
you couldn't ride with me. So they, the other two guys came, and then I have to go in the car with these two guys that I don't even know. But they don't, they didn't do nothing to me. But I was afraid, you know. I was a girl from a little town that they take me, and uh, I don't know how many houses we stopped by. So many houses. And some of the houses, the guy will tell me, like, you stay in the car, hide, and I'll hide, you know? And, and he'll tell me, like, don't turn you, you head, and I'll, I'll hide. And then the guy carry a gun. So after that, I remember they take me a picture, and he, and he says, she's blonde. I'm going to cross her on the line. They give me a passport and I think was fake so they he told me like you have to memorize this is your name and this is your and then you're gonna cross and you're gonna say uh, why are you crossing where are you going you say then you're going to see some friends on the border because you go shopping <laughs> that was the first time my name is Lerman Montoya and I was born in Los Angeles California but I've lived in Arizona since I was seven years old both of my parents are Mexican immigrants from Culiacán, Sinaloa um, both of my parents immigrated to the United States, specifically to the LA, LA County region in the 1990s, early 90s. Um, my mom in Mexico was actually going to school to be a nurse and she was in nursing school, graduated and when she was ready to get um, into her residency and her internship, um, she found out she was pregnant. She had a romance with this guy in her village and it wasn't a very good relationship. He was cheating on her and my aunt, who my great aunt actually, who was living in the United States and was actually granted amnesty um, through ERCA in the Reagan administration. So she was able to go back to Mexico because she was a legal resident now and she was able to travel back and forth. And when she was in Mexico visiting my mom, my mom was like, I'm pregnant. and my great aunt told my mom, she's like, well, you can't stay here. You have to come to the United States. There's more opportunities. You have an education background um, as a nurse. Like, there's just more opportunities for you to come. And without saying goodbye to anyone, goodbye to the guy who had impregnated her that she was dating, without saying goodbye to my grandparents and her siblings, she packed her bags and the next day her and my aunt drove to the Mexico, Mexico US border and my mom entered. Um, it's weird that she said that they just entered. I mean, thinking about it now, it's, there's such a huge process and the way that she made it sound was just so easy. I guess it just shows you that the regulation of the border has just intensified um, in recent years. But, so that was how my mom entered into the United States. And for my dad, it was a little bit, it was more easy. So actually my grandma, my dad's mom, was a US citizen. So my great, great grandfather actually immigrated from Spain and to Mexico and he settled in the Sinaloa area, which is in the west coast of Mexico, um, across like Baja California. And he grew up there, he, he had his um, children, and then my great-grandfather actually moved to LA and he worked in Paramount Studios. Um, he tells the stories of like in the late 1920s or 1930s, my, my grandma would tell stories about him seeing celebrities and he just worked as like a studio cleaner, but that was like his Hollywood moment, I guess. Um, so my grandma was actually born in LA and during the beginning of World War II, they were actually really afraid of um, any type of attacks of, from the Japanese into California. So they moved to Mexico where my great-great-grandfather had settled and had um, created a name for himself, I guess, in like agriculture. And so my grandma lived her life, had a ton of children, 14 children, and they all have like a million children and my family's huge. but. So they were all able to move to the United States and have like an easier life immigrating. Um, so my dad was a resident when he came into the United States, but never actually went through the citizenship process. And um, that kind of later became an issue because when I was seven in California growing up, he was sent to jail. So. Um, my dad was involved in the drug trafficking trade in with the Sinaloa drug cartel in the United States doing a lot of networking and drug transportation in the West Coast and in the Midwest. 
and he was locked up and because he didn't have he was a resident they could I guess easily take that away from him if he decided to self-deport in a sense um, instead of serving a longer jail sentence because he was sentenced to like around 22 years and instead of serving that he decided to self-deport in a sense and he only had to serve the like 11 years half of the sentence. So one book I really enjoyed in the class was American Gulag by Mark Dow. He was a former journalist and did an investigative piece on the INS, now DHS, ICE um, prison system. And this book really stood out to me because my father, who was an undocumented immigrant, actually was in a um, prison facility and was later deported. So initially this first, this book really stuck out to me because of my familial ties to immigration and the prison system. And I guess something interesting about this book is that it really revealed um, to most people and to a lot of people the cruelties of a lot of INS facilities at the time. Um, and those haven't gotten better. So during the actual class, it was really, really hard to get a hold of my grandma and just have her um, tell me our stories. And so it was, in, it was actually after the class ended and it was winter break, I went back to Mexico and I was determined to get her story and to not only get her story, but my other family's stories. So I brought with me my DSLR camera that I had purchased that semester and I was like, oh my god, I need to take photos of my family members and write their stories and do some weird family tree. Like the class really inspired me to really focus my um, winter break vacation in Mexico to like research my family. And so I told my dad, I was like, dad, please tell grandma that I want to like just sit her down and like make her walk me through her life story. And so we went to her house and Obviously she knew that she was going to be on camera, so she put on a ton of makeup, had like three outfit changes before she finally was like, okay, you can take photos of me and interview me because I, it was so hilarious. Um, but so finally she went through this, through this cabinet that she had and she went through tons of boxes of just pictures, of old pictures of um, my, my dad growing up, my aunt growing up, and pictures of her when she was young in California, and actually a picture of my great grandfather and three of his brothers so it was really amazing to see those tangible documents she showed me wedding certificates she showed me birth certificates I was like oh my god like this is so cool it's everything that I had been wanting to show and prove during the actual class that I didn't really get a chance to do because of the distance and because of just like the lack of communication between me and my grandma and it was a really beautiful moment just seeing her reaction when she was retelling the story of her life and I don't think a lot of people have ever asked her to tell her the story of her life. I remember my cousin was sitting next to me and she was like, Oh my god, grandma, like, like, can you stop already? Like, she was my cousin, my little cousin was kind of annoyed. And I was like, oh my god, shut up. Like, this is gold. Like, this is our life story. Like, um, so it's super interesting to just kind of sit her down and get her to walk me through this process of her life. And in a lot of moments you could see that she was revealing things that she hadn't revealed before about our family, like our life, my uncle, my who had passed away. Um, she started crying at one point because I don't think she really had time to process a lot of the things in her life. So I was finally there like asking her all these questions and I don't know, I really brought us closer in a sense because I was all ears too. I was taking a lot of photos of the photographs that she had preserved and she had kept and I was writing a, a, a list. I asked her, I was like, okay, who's your oldest daughter? Who are her kids? Who did she marry? Who are the kids' kids? And she re memorized all of this. And so I wrote on my notes on my iPhone this whole entire like page of just names, like bam, 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 this person married this person. They got married to this person. They had these many kids. And I don't think a lot of people have really taken the time, especially in my family, to ask about that and or preserve it in a way. And I think that's the importance of oral history is talking to family members and getting their stories and preserving them and then passing them along to our future generations so my kids will know where I came from and then they'll know where my mom came from and so on and so forth and um, I don't know I hope that through that those perspectives of my family and my grandma's life can help other people I guess understand their their place in the United States and their sense of Americanism and this weird idea and concept of what it, what it is to be American, um, I guess get some reference points and get some inspiration and get some clarity through the stories that we shared.